Hey everybody, my name is Chelsea Nebby and today I'm going to talk to you about what the AMC thinks about the MCAT. Stay tuned. Okay, so I am so, so, so excited about this video. Before I get into it, no, I'm not from California. <laughs> I was born in New York, raised in New Jersey, high school in Texas, college in DC. I'm obviously going to California for medical school, but I'm not from California. This is just my brother's shirt, and he just he just stopped by. Anywho, the reason why I'm so excited about this, in, uh, not interview, about this video is because when I was on my UCSF interview, on my last day, they were holding my luggage for me. So when I was done with all my, when I was done with all my interviews for the day, I, Sorry. I went to go pick up my luggage and I saw this hanging out on like a table. Now it looked like it was up for grabs. It looked like it was up for grabs for anyone. And it says using MCAT data in 2018 medical student selection, right? So I'm like, this looks juicy. I am definitely gonna take it. And I read through the whole thing. It's, it's not that long, obviously, um, but I read through the whole thing. It really, it, it doesn't really seem like it's written for students. That's why I kind of felt guilty after taking it. I was like, I don't know if this is like classified information. I don't know what that is. It's okay, I'm moving soon. <laughs> no, um, I don't know if this is classified information. Like, I definitely will feel bad if I wasn't supposed to like have my hands on it, but it literally was just like out there, just sitting on a counter, a whole stack of them. I think I was, I think I'm okay in taking this, right? What are you looking for? I think I left the house key and the car key. Oh, okay. Choose. Okay, so what I did was I took a bunch of notes and they have some really cool diagrams. So I, I, you know, I always say I hope it's gonna be a quick video and like you always know, it never ends up being quick. But I'm gonna try my best. I'm not gonna elaborate on much because I don't even know if you can order this online. I don't know if you guys have access to this. I've literally only seen this booklet once in my life. Obviously I took the new MCAT. I think I took the new MCAT in its second year, maybe third, but I'm thinking I took it in its second year. So I think this booklet was really just trying to establish like how to view it. You know, it's definitely, even though it says, I took it in 2018, right? But they're still talking about it as though it's very new and like, you know, the grades haven't settled, if you know what I mean. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through my notes and all my notes correlate with pictures or just passages. So let's just jump right into it. Ooh, okay. I don't know how that happened. Um, page five, they emphasize that it really, truly is a holistic process, a holistic review process. Oh my God, y'all. At least my lips aren't too chapped in this episode. Yes, yes. I know sometimes I'd be coming here crazy. I'm better now. Okay, <laughs> but hopefully we don't have any more disruptions. Okay, so they're all saying like, oh, it's a holistic review process. Okay, you know, as much as I do believe that like medical schools are really trying to see who you are as a person, I would never want to fool someone into thinking that your GPA and MCAT aren't the most important things on your application. Like, they get your foot in the door, they speak for you the loudest, it is what it is. So keep that in mind. I'm probably gonna like, maybe do like a screenshot of this. Let's see if I can get it on the camera on the first try. Screenshot of this little table. I think it's so interesting because they rank how important certain things are. And so for example, some of the things that I noted was that community service and vol, so wait, community service, community service and volunteering, whether it's medical, sorry, Yes, yes, yes. Oh my God. Oh my God. It, I don't even know if you guys can hear it, but it's like so annoying. I think it's because he slams the freaking door. I will be moving soon. Okay. So community service and volunteering, whether it's medical and medical. Oh my God. I feel like I should just redo this whole video, but that's fine. The energy is stale, but we're going to work with it. Let me drink some water because I'm just, I'm pissed. All right. Okay. So, community service or volunteering, whether it's medical slash clinical or not medical slash clinical, is of the highest importance in the category of experiences, right? And I wrote that I was so wrong about this. It is true that this booklet is written for MD students, but I think MD PhD students fit right in. It's funny though, because they actually don't even have research as 
you know, as being considered of the highest importance. I think that's very interesting because research, research is of medium importance, which I think is, I don't even believe that. Me personally, I'm, I'm not even gonna lie, I don't even believe that. I think that depends on where you go because Stanford, for example, is very big on research. So for Stanford, I think that would be of higher importance. That's just me, I don't know. Reading this back, I'm like, I really don't know. It's funny because if you, I don't know when the order in which I'll upload all these videos, but one of the videos that I just recorded was all about how I feel like, oh, I'm a URM and I just got in because I'm a URM. Truth of the matter is, that race and ethnicity under the demographics category is only of medium importance. It's not even of high importance. That to me is groundbreaking because a lot of people like to make it seem that if you're black and or Hispanic, then you could just slide into med school. And I've even seen URMs, you know, not get into med school. So like, <laughs> I'm just, I'm sorry. But anywho, it's actually funny because in the demographics category, what is of the highest importance is US citizenship or permanent residency, state residency, probably for like state schools, and rural slash urban underserved backgrounds, which to me is kind of, I, I won't get into it. I won't get it. This is not a political channel. I won't get into it, but it's a little side eye. I don't know. Then again, you can easily say that a lot of black and brown people live in urban underserved backgrounds. So it's not that bad. Anyway, of medium importance is paid employment, medical or clinical, and other extracurricular activities. Of the lowest importance is teaching slash tutoring slash teaching assistant, honors, awards and recognitions, conferences attended, presentations, posters and publications. I'm floored, I'm floored. I thought these things were of the highest importance, especially honors, awards, recognition. Tutoring, I thought that was of the highest importance. I'm not even lying to you. So I have to say, take it with a grain of salt because you know, I don't think this really applies to MD, PhD. Like, I really just don't. They're saying that community service that is not medical or clinical is worth more than research. Like, clearly this doesn't apply to MD, PhD, so I won't even dwell on it, but I'll put like a PDF of this graph on the screen so you can see, because the academic metrics are really interesting. Like, yeah, the MCAT of the highest importance, GPA, uh, your science GPA of the highest importance, even your cumulatives of the highest importance. So yeah, there's just really interesting stuff. First generation immigrant status is of the lowest importance, gender of the lowest importance, fluency in multiple languages of the lowest importance, which I'm just like, it takes a lot, okay, to be fluent. Then again, if you learn as a kid, it's not that serious. Anyway, let's try and move right along. It's already nine minutes. Okay, so there was a quote on numbers on page six. It's always good to keep in mind that maybe medicine isn't for you if you can't ace the MCAT. Otherwise, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. I really, really love that. Let me, let me see what they say. Yes, yes, okay. The MCAT is designed to help medical school admissions committees select students who are academically prepared for medical school and to predict students' academic performance in the pre-clerkship years, as well as the academic portions of students' work in the clerkship years. So this is really important because, you know, First of all, I feel like if y'all are interested in MD-PhD, I'm assuming that you already are pretty strong in the sciences. I'm just assuming, but you never know who you're talking to. So if I am talking to someone who's struggling in, in their science classes or who has tried the MCAT once or twice and can't get above like a 505, and not to say that like, I don't know, there are people who get into MD programs with a 505. There's probably people who get into MD-PhD programs with a 505. But I'm just saying like, if the MCAT is really bringing you down, it's okay to step back and realize that like medicine may not be for you. I think a lot of us come into the profession because yeah, we want to help people, but you can help people a number of ways. A lot of us come into the profession, at least in part because of the prestige and the reputation that it has. And I'm not even saying that it's a bad thing because like we are all biased in life. Like I'm really not here. I, I like to give it to you straight. Like I don't like to like sugarcoat things. You know what I mean? If being a doctor had the same societal connotation as being a janitor, few people would want to be a doctor. Let's be real. Let's be real. So at the same time, like we, we're not all equipped. We're not all made to 
go through medical school. It's, it's a real stress. Yeah, I haven't even begun, but it's a real stress. And so you want to be kind to yourself and realize that, you know what, maybe it's not for you. Maybe you were made to be like a prolific writer and you're just like getting sidetracked by a dream from your childhood. You know what I mean? Like it, it happens. So I, I really like that. So I want to read another quote. Two important features of the new MCAT exam are that it gives examinees more working time per question than the old exam and the scores it reports are more precise than scores from the old exam. And the reason why it's more precise is because it has more questions. I love that. Yeah, and, and so it actually gives us more time for questions. Let's just keep moving on. Keep chugging. The new MCAT scores draw attention to the center of the scales and the top half of the distributions to encourage admissions committees to consider applicants with a, wider, with a wider range of scores than they have in the past. This is very, very interesting. So the AMC is low-key trying to help us by highlighting the mean, which tends to do well anyway. Yeah, I think when I was reading through, they were saying that like people who score within the average are not bad students. So even though I was throwing shade on a 505, like people who score a 500, most technically and, and literally and theoretically, most people score within the 500 range. And what they're showing is that those students aren't necessarily bad students. Now, if you're all the way on the other side of the spectrum of like the 400s, <laughs> you know, it's, we don't have to talk about it. But I think, you know, the AMC is really trying to help us. So let me keep moving. Okay, so page nine. The percentile ranks are updated on May 1st every year to reflect the results from previous calendar years. Yes, and this is really interesting because your percentile rank may change from the time you take it to the time you apply, but probably not by much. So it's funny because when I took the test, I scored within the 96th percentile. And I was like, oh my God, I'm top 5%. Oh my God, oh my God. And then like, I think maybe a year later. No, 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 I think I applied. Yeah, I think I applied a year after I took my MCAT. Yeah, yeah, a year after I took my MCAT. I thought I was still in the 96th percentile because they update it every year once they get more information. And I actually moved down to the 95th and I was like, <laughs> just I'm just like, ooh, okay. But obviously it's not that big a deal, but I just thought that was an interesting fun fact. Okay, so now we're moving to page 12. I hope this isn't too scattered, but I'm really not trying to have a 30 minute video, which we'll see. Okay, yes, okay, this is another another little graph. Again, I don't even know why I'm bothering to like center it on my camera because I know I'm just gonna take a picture and like throw it on the screen. I should just continue with that. One in five exam takers repeat the exam. Don't expect to take the test twice, but if you do, oh well. I think that was really important because a lot of people, I've met some people who literally go into the test assuming they'll take it twice. And me personally, I feel like when you go into it with that mindset, you're more likely to take it twice and I really don't believe you need to take it twice. I firmly believe you can get it on the first go. You just have to be aware. And I don't really talk into how I prep in this playlist, sorry, in this video. Once I get into the other videos in this playlist, I'll really talk about how you need to prep, how I prepped, mistakes I made, and the things that helped me because you can get this, you got this. Like, please shoot for a 528. You know, let me not even get into it because I really feel so strongly about this. Like, you got this. Don't play yourself. You will not retake it. You will get a 528 the first time. Okay, anyway. Yeah, but it shows that like one in five people retake the test. So if you, if something does happen, you know, life happens, even outside of you studying for the MCAT, life happens. So if something happens, you gotta retake it, it's fine. One in five people retake it. And in a, as, as we move along in the book, they show how well retakers do on the exam. So keep that in mind as well. Okay, yes. So many people decided to take biochem to prepare for the new exam, but don't forget to take biochem Two. Okay, so this is a, I don't have to show you, I don't have to show you. <laughs> I will put it on the screen. But first let me say the numbers of examinees taking courses in biochemistry, psychology, sociology, and statistics were higher than in the past. I don't even know why they said this. This is not breaking news. You put it on the new MCAT, obviously we're gonna take it. Like, that was not that, <laughs> I, I don't know why that was even breaking news. Like, of course it's gonna be higher than in the past because it's on the test, it's required now. We have to know it, duh. But yeah, I just wanna say in my school, and it, this is probably the same like most schools. Biochemistry is split up into two semesters. You have Biochemistry 1 and 2. A lot of people in my school only took Biochemistry 1 for the MCAT. Take 1 and 2. I would even say, in my opinion, 2 may even be more important 
for the MCAT than one is. I promise you. Take biochemistry one and two. I think biochemistry one, it's really foggy now, but biochemistry one was like introducing you to all the amino acids. Wait, is it the amino acids? Yeah, that make up the protein. See, do you see how foggy this is? Wow, wish me luck guys. But biochemistry one was introducing you to a lot of basics, right? Just the basics. And then biochemistry two actually introduces you to like systems in the body, the Krebs cycle and like, I mean, I feel like most of the biochemistry on the MCAT is like the Krebs cycle. Like, and like glycolysis and things like that. Is that the same thing? Yeesh, it's been a while. That's fine. Oh yeah, I also think on this chart that I'll, that I'll put on the screen, it's really interesting because they looked at the stats of people who took a course. And I'm definitely gonna get into this. I'm definitely gonna get into this. But they show that like, I'm sure you guys know how to read a chart, but oh well. Khan Academy, 47% of people took a Khan Academy course, which is free online. True, that's free online. Or at least used it in some way to help the MCAT. 6% of people took a course from their university or from their medical school. And 42% of people took a commercial course, which is obviously like Capstan, Kaplan and Princeton Review. I've met so many people. It's actually for me, I think it's kind of rare to find somebody who took the course. I've met so many people who swear by the fact that you don't need a course to do well. And honestly, from what I've seen now, obviously, you know, this is like N equals 13 or so. Um, you know, I, and I didn't, I didn't ask everybody, but from what I've seen, the people who don't take a course score higher. That's what I've seen. People who do take a course, they don't, I mean, not, let me not say they don't score well. That's not my point. What I'm trying to say is that you don't need a course to score well. The people who I've seen scoring 95th percentile and higher, like 98, 99, they did not take a course. And so I'm letting you know you don't need to take a course. That doesn't mean that you don't need any course material. That's different. But they didn't pay for like a, a full out course. I'm not against courses. We'll talk about that later. But I'm just letting you know. A lot of people who take the course, sometimes they regret it because they don't take the course seriously. They think the course is going to do the work for them. That's not how it works. Kind of tricky situation there. Okay, so next bullet point. Just other, ugh, why, why can't I ever speak? Just under 50% of people took some sort of course. I just said that. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me just read the bullet point. Just under 50% of people took some sort of course for the exam. I didn't, but I didn't know that Khan Academy offered a free MCAT collection of videos and test questions. So yes, go online. Khan Academy has a whole thing ready for you. Okay, let's go to page 15. Okay. Data shows that on average, a repeater's second attempt will increase by 2.6 seven points. I thought this was really interesting because I was told that like, I was told that repeating won't help you. I was kind of told that you're likely to score within the same range. You might even score lower. I know that even though I wasn't very, very happy with my score, again, I got a 517. It's, it's so weird. Like I was content with being 96 percentile, but I was not content with like a 517. It really, to this day, I'm, I'm really not happy with it. It is what it is. And, and I, I don't mind the fact that I like, have high standards for myself, but at the same time, like let's be realistic. Let's not be, you know, too anal. But anywho, I find that really interesting because like, I wasn't really tempted to retake the test. I told myself if I got lower than a 515, I would retake it. Just because I felt like where I wanted to go, a 515 would not get me in. So that's one thing, right? But I didn't realize, I, I kind of thought that if you retake the course, then you're just gonna have the same score or lower. The reality is that, yeah, technically, the majority of people will have a higher score, but they're not going to shoot to the moon. Um, if you look at the chart, which will be on the screen, you'll see that non-repeaters on average, you know, run the gamut of scores, but they kind of score a little bit higher on average. And then people who take a first attempt, I'm really confused right now. Oh, on their first attempt, their first attempt is lower than their second attempt, but you know, if you look at these scores, the people who repeat, even their second attempt is not as high as people who get it right the first time. So for me, that just kind of emphasizes that you really want to, you really want to get it right the first time. That's really, really, really important. So anywho, let's just move on. I feel like I'm making good time though. I'm not even mad. Yeah, I'm not mad. Okay, so if you score below a 510, chances are high that your score will increase. If you score below a 518, what page is this on? I don't see this. 
Right, okay, this is page 17, right? If you score above a 518, chances are high that your score will decrease if you retake the exam. That's pretty obvious, but I, I think it's still important to emphasize. There are students, and I have seen them on SDM, there are students who will get like, literally a 518 and say that they wanna retake it because they want like a 525. No. I mean, okay, okay, let me not say no. Let me not, let me not hold you back from being great, okay? Let me not hold you back from being great, but just think about it. You know what I mean? Just think about it. If the rest of your application is super solid, right, and the type of school that you wanna go to is not necessarily Harvard or Hopkins. Do you need a 525? Do, plus, because to me, I feel like you're risking a lot of things. If you score a 520 and retake it because you want a 528, you will look, and I'm not, uh, hi, mommy. Okay, I think you'll look really neurotic. I'm not gonna lie, because it shows that you're not content with like, it shows that you're too much of a perfectionist. Like, let's be real, 520 is like 98th percentile, 99th percentile. You know, like if you retake it, cause you know what I mean, when you're so close to a good score, that's kind of bad. Even me with a 517, I wanted to retake. I didn't want to do the actual work, but like I wanted to get a better score, but retaking it at a 517, not only is that risky, but it's just kind of like, you look like you're a little too neurotic, a little too perfectionist, right? On the other hand, if your score was is like extremely low like they said I think they said below a 510 below a 510 you actually have room to increase and especially if you're motivated enough to retake the test you may find that you just weren't prepared you just weren't like the test just kind of caught you off guard when I talk about how I prepared for the test I will be clear the test caught me off guard luckily I caught myself last minute but it caught me off guard so I don't know that's just something to think about if you if you ever consider like if you get your test back and like you're not happy Happy and you want to retake it think about it just think about it of course it's really hard if you fall in between 510 and the 518 you're like I don't know what will happen but you also have to consider do you even have time to study for this test all over again probably not especially if you're applying to MD PhD programs okay oh page 18 here's a quote some admissions committees use all exam scores in conjunction with other information about academic preparation that might explain any score changes. Other admissions committees use applicants' most recent exam scores in the admissions process. Others use each applicant's best score as represented by the highest total score from a single attempt. And still others compute the average total score across the multiple attempts. Okay. Every school handles multiple scores by test takes differently so again one of the things that i find really difficult about like retaking the mcat right uh, oh i never even broke down like my score in each individual okay i don't remember too well i'm not gonna lie but i'll, I'll obviously like, put the correct stuff on the screen but I, from memory i think biology i got a 132 no no sorry chemistry and physics i got a 132 biology i got a 131 is this correct I don't, I feel like I'm inflating these scores in my mind. Oh well. And what was that other section? It wasn't cars. Psychology, I got a 130. And then cars, I got like a 127. Cars basically brought me down. And I'll explain why in my next videos. But the thing with like taking the MCAT again, right, is that obviously I did pretty well in, in chemistry and physics. And I would say I did well in like most, in all the subjects except for cars. And so it's kind of like, if I retake the test, who's to say that I'll do well on all those other subjects again? I feel like if I retook the test, I'd probably focus so much on cars and neglect the other subjects, and then I retake the test, cars is shining, then the other subjects are lacking. So it's something you really have to keep in mind. Like, it's 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 a beast. You want to get it right the first time, and, and I will do all I can to give you good advice to get it right the first time. Okay, over 50% of applicants in 2017 had a GPA of 3.6 or above, and almost 75% of applicants in 2017 had a GPA of 3.4 or above. This is really interesting to me because I kind of felt like, G oh, oh yeah, yeah. What page is this? Oh, this is page 22. What happened to page 21? Okay, whatever. Maybe we'll get back to it. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, page 21 shows like a mean distribution of like MCAT scores between 2015, 2016, and 2017. Basically, scores jumped from 20, 2016 to 2017. And I'll put that graph on the screen. So 500 is like no longer the mean, I guess. But... Oh well, that's not really important. Yeah, and here's this other chart that, which I think is so interesting because GPA doesn't follow a Gaussian dis distribution, a Gaussian curve like MCAT scores do. And I think that kind of 
I don't want to say it like took me down a notch. It just kind of made me realize that like having a G having a stellar GPA is expected. Maybe not a 4.0, that's fine. But having a really good GPA is kind of expected. Like people, it's like, let me see the percent of people who have a who have a 4.0. Oh wait, you know, this is a confusing graph. I don't really think I have time to look through it. Oh no, I see, I see, I see. So 28% of people, 28% <laughs> of people have a GPA of 3.8 or above. So I, to me, that feels like, you know, it's stiff competition in the GPA section, as far as I'm concerned. I feel like when you have a strong GPA and a strong MCAT, then you're solid, you look great. When you only have a strong GPA and your MCAT is like sad, not even just like, you know, almost there, but like sad. Nah, like, I don't know. I, I, I just, I have a lot to say on that, but I'm trying to not make this video go too long. Anywho, anywho, moving on. In 2017 over, did I just say that? I just said that. Hold on. What's going on on page 22? I just said that. And then 23. Oh, okay. Anyway, I talked about applicants. Let me reread this. Okay. Over 50% of applicants in 2017 had a GPA of 3.6 or above and almost 75% of applicants in 2017 had a GPA of 3.4 or above. Those are the applicants, and GPA distribution does not follow a Gaussian curve like the MCAT scores. In 2017, same year, over 50% of matriculants, so applicants who got accepted somewhere, had a GPA of 3.8 or above. Over 75% of applicants who got accepted somewhere, accepted applicants, matriculants, had a GPA of 3.6 or above. The MCAT scores of accepted students still follow a normal distribution, but it's heavily skewed. I don't know where I got this information. I mean, I obviously like, you know, analyzed the graph, but this graph is not a type of graph that you read on the fly. <laughs> Cause I'm just like, it's like three different like columns and metrics. But anywho, I thought that was very important because it reinforces my point. Like GPA is not everything. I feel like you're expected to have a good GPA. And that's the reason why that's important is because you're showing like four to five years of hard work. You're showing your character. I, I personally think that GPA shows your character. You know, you can't fake or cover up four to five years of hard work. And I'm not saying that, you know, people don't have turnarounds because they have them all the time. Schools love upward trends. Maybe your first and second year, you were just kind of like flailing about and not really like thinking seriously. Then third year, you got on top of it. Everything was A's since then. That's great. Your GPA will not really look that hot, but it's good that you, that you got the turnaround. I think most medical students were good from the get-go and most medical students who get in are good from the get-go. So especially if you're a freshman and you wanna to go to medical school, please be serious from the beginning. There's no reason why you can't get a 4.0 your first semester. I don't know why people think that it's like a fairy tale to get a 4.0 your first semester. Like it's, it's very doable. I feel like that's the easiest time. Anywho, I think I have one last thing. No, I don't, I don't. So <laughs> that's all I have for today. That was pretty much all the main points, all the interesting points that I found with this little booklet. There's some other things. I don't even know why I didn't look at, I don't know what this, what this is. They have something about USMLE results, which I'm very interested in, but that's fine. I don't really care. What I do think is important though, even though I didn't highlight it before, is the fact that this, a lot of this data was collected from MCAT validity committees, which I'm really not sure what that is. <laughs> but the schools that they have on this committee, I'll definitely give you a picture of this. Schools that they have on this, oh, it says right here, the MCAT validity committee established a research agenda to study the fairness, use, impact, and predictive validity of scores from the new exam. The validity research agenda includes three areas of investigation with related research questions about the use of the new MCAT, uh, the use of the new exam, and its impact on examinees, applicants, medical students, and medical school admissions committees. So I think that's really cool. And what I also like is that the schools, the participating medical schools on this MCAT validity committee range from like top tier to like, I've never heard of you before a type of school. They even have a DO school, an osteopathic medicine school. So I, oh, Morehouse, oh wow. Yeah, so I really, really like that range. I think that that's really great. I really hate when like anything academic is dominated by like top tier schools. It's just, I hate that. But, <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much all I have. And I'm just gonna wrap it up before it gets any longer. I have a lot to do today. So 
Like if you want to like, share if you want to share, subscribe if you want to subscribe. If you don't want to subscribe, subscribe anyway. Tweet me questions on Twitter if you have them. My handle is mdphdandme. My website is also mdphdandme.com. Ask me questions on my website or my Twitter. And I think that's everything. I think that's everything. Bye.